go ahead and talk about how long you've been placing implants and what you've learned about implant design in that time. Well, I don't want to give my age away, <laughs> but I placed my first implants, two implants, they were blade implants, on March 9th, 1970. I'll never forget that date because it had such a big impact on my life. After I placed those two implants and I told the patient that they were my first patient, that she was my first patient, I didn't know if they were going to last 10 minutes or 10 years, but I'm willing to try because she hated this bilateral mandibular partial that she had. She was willing to try anything as well. So I placed the two implants. They were uh, designed for immediate temporaries. You had to prepare two abutment teeth, made a fixed temporary, and the patient went home with a teeth that didn't come out. So my partner, whose name was Jack as well, said, how did you like it? And I said, Jack, I don't want to do anything else. It was such a high for me to think that you took something that nature took away, however they did it, and you give a patient back comfort and function, something that nature did take away. And so the bug bit me, and then I wanted to start learning as much as I could, uh, getting what about, experience. What about, the what about the implant designs? Let's say implants that you used 46 right. years ago versus now. And well, of course, from the blade type implants, then when Brandemark first came to this country, we talked about these root form implants, which we didn't know much about. We didn't have much experience with them because in those days all we knew were blade type implants and subperiosteal implants. So this was something new. So then we started placing our first root form type implants, which weren't designed by Branamark. Um, they were copies of different kinds. And we started with, I started with a finned um, tape, a, 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 fin, a, a finned um, root form implant. And so we were pretty excited about that. We were placing them. But what we saw about three, four years down the road, if the patient lost any crustal bone, then they started having the first top of the fins exposed. And then that increased periimplantitis. But we didn't know what it was called periimplantitis. It was just starting to cause gum problems and infection and what have you. So I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe an implant should be designed like the neck of a tooth, that the neck of a tooth is kind of smooth and uh, round, but didn't have any grooves or fins, so that if you did lose bone, you had some safety, that you could do an apical reposition flap and stop any problems before it got into the threads or fins. So then we started with my first venture was a root form, threaded root form, that was named and marketed by Danar, but it was called Stereos. Danar was an articulator company involved in occlusion, and they thought that it would be a good marriage to be involved in implant dentistry because naturally you have to restore these implants and they were in the restorative business. So we went along and the first design had a four millimeter neck, a four millimeter collar, which was machined before it had threads. So therefore that implant had to be fairly long. So the shortest implant was 12 millimeters to, and 16. There were no 10s, there were no 8s, nothing shorter because we had the 4 millimeter collar. So we followed those implants. The engineer came up with a controlled protocol where every implant was charted as to where it was placed, the quality of bone, the color of the tissue, um, and then when it was uncovered, the, again, the same evaluation, any granulation tissue, any bone loss, and uh, mobility. 
and we went along with this for maybe two, three years. Then the engineer said, there's a demand for shorter implants. We can't do shorter implants with four millimeter neck. We're not, charge, we're not showing any markable bone loss with this four millimeter collar. We, if we shorten it by two, we can come to down to 10 millimeter implants. I said, fine, shorten it to two millimeter machine collar. And that's what we did for a number of years. So for a number of years, we're placing the stereos threaded implants. And then uh, some people uh, were doing cylindrical press fit implants that were hydroxyapatite coated. So we figured, well, we'll try some of those. And we did some of those, but we couldn't get the primary stability that we like to have, especially if we're going to do an immediate restoration, a provisional restoration. So we kind of went away from those. Um, the success rates weren't as high as we had with the threaded because of uh, being able to uh, have this initial primary stability. So then going back to the threaded implants, parallel walled, two millimeter machine collar was good. The problem is then in my situation, since the implant bug bit me, I narrowed my practice down to just implant placements and implant prosthetics. That's all we did. Implants in the morning, prosthetics in the afternoon, and to this day, that's what I still do. So we look at cases, and if you get your implant classes on, the cases, some weeks, they're similar. So one day, I had four single implants, four different patients with a missing tooth or an immediate placement from the areas of six to uh, 11. So that is in the aesthetic zone and you're dealing with the anatomy is the subnasal fossa. So we're using a parallel wild implant. Naturally, I want to use as long an implant as I can and I don't want to penetrate the buccal bone and I want to keep it away from the thin buccal plate. So what am I finding myself doing? I was tilting the implants out so I could bypass and not penetrate or perforate the subnasal fossa. So that one day, four different patients, four different implants, four different tilts. So now when it comes time to restoring, I have to make a severely angled abutment to bring it in. So I kind of dream implants and I'm, I'm, uh, woke up one o'clock in the morning one night and uh, jumped out of bed and my wife said, what's wrong? And I said, nothing, nothing, I have to do something. So I ran in the kitchen, got some paper and pencil and I'm thinking, if teeth that came out have tapered roots, why are we putting square pegs in tapered holes? So I drew the first tapered threaded implant and uh, then I'm thinking, I got to come up with a name. So what do we do? We replace teeth. That's what we're doing. So I came up with the name replace. So um, I called, I, I felt very strong about this because if you look at the anatomy of the upper and lower jaw, the bone is not square. Bone, if you section it, we're looking at a series of triangles. In the upper, you have the subnasal fossa. In the lower anterior, you got the digastric fossa. You've got the buccal fossa. And in the posterior mandible, you got the submandibular fossa. So we're all dealing with constricted anatomical places. And the tapered implant allows you to place a longer implant with a wider prosthetic table, which is probably the most important part uh, in anatomically constricted areas. So I called the president of an implant company who I was friends with and said, so I got an idea that's just going to revolutionize your company. He said, but it's going to kill 
my other products. I said, whatever it does, you'll more than make up for it. So I couldn't convince him to do it. So this was going on for a few years, back and forth, and finally I got frustrated and I said, well, I'm going to do it. And uh, they said, no, no, don't do that. And uh, we want you to be with us. So we did it and it was very popular and it grew to be one of the most widely used in the world. But that's not the end. I, we d do good. We look at the Apple company, the computer companies. So I'm thinking there's still some improvements that we need to make. It's good. It works good. We get some good primary stability, but not as much as I would like. So, no, we don't want to change things. Um, it's good. People like it. And why should we change? I said, why does Apple change? Why do we need, for instance, today, why do we need iPhone 7? iPhone 6 works, but there's, there's just some other things that can be better. That's good. Jack, so, so we're, um, you know, this format, we're going to kind of condense it. But if you could, let's say, are there a couple of points that you'd say, hey, you know, there's all these other implants out there. Why do we need a new one? Yeah. Just talk about a couple of things that you've oh, encapsulated. You mean as far as tapered? Yeah, like, or, you know, hey, you know, it's, it's a tapered yeah, system. It's a conical uh, connection. It's ideal for uh, immediate replacement. It's got, it's got the, uh, uh, the machined collar right. that we know works so well. So just, to, you know, just maybe those three right. points that you think are, are the most important yeah. reasons why we're out there. Okay. And what the benefit is, like what, what's in it for the doctor, for the machine collar? There are many, many implants out there. Some implants have conical connection, some have trilobe connections, some have hex top connections. Um, some are, um, have some taper, some only have taper at the bottom. Um, some have uh, a different uh, collar designs, and this and that. So what, what I, I try to do is not to reinvent the wheel, but look at what's good and what I didn't think was so good and try to incorporate the good features that we see from other systems, whatever, and incorporate it into one implant. Now, I was strong on the machine collar because I have paid implants that are in function for over 40 years with machine collars. And we can back it up with radiographs on patients that we still follow that are still involved in my practice or that are still living. So I wanted to keep that. So in the Han implant, I insisted that we keep a one millimeter machine collar. And why, why do I feel that way? When we have the coated surfaces or rough surfaces at the very top, at the interface of the abutment, there's chances that bacteria are going to get there. Then we have to be honest. We know that patients really most don't do great, great home care. So it's an area that can be an endotoxin generator. So once that starts, a lot of times we don't catch it in time and it goes. Well, this helps prevent that. So, you know, how do I know that? Okay, so I was placing implants for a while that were, had surfaces, rough surfaces at the very top. And I was placing implants that have a two millimeter machine collar. The ones that were coated or roughened to the top in posterior maxilla we were getting more periimplantitis than I'd ever seen. And it concerned me. So I went totally back to doing the two millimeter machine collar. Well, we didn't need the two millimeter. We could do it with one. So if we do it with one, we can have more primary stability because we can add more threads. Now let's get to the thread design. Then I was doing a um, tapered implant with not an aggressive thread design. And then I was doing a tapered somewhat tapered implant with a very aggressive thread design. So what we found, the one that didn't have as much thread aggressiveness, 
We didn't have as good primary stability, and I do a lot of immediate replacements. Uh, thank goodness for endodontic treated teeth with posts. I call it pre-implant therapy. So, um, and I have a lecture, it's kind of my favorite thing to do, called the emergency implant, where a patient comes in with a broken, a non-restored, endodontically treated tooth, where we can take it out. Well, with the, with the tread pattern, that's not as aggressive. When we go to place the implant, the palatal bone is more dense than the thin labial bone. And what happens is that uh, dense palatal bone wants to muscle the implant and push it to the buckle. We call it walking the implant. A lot of times you don't see it until it's too late. Then the patient comes in, we see some redness of the gum, and uh, we start seeing some labial bone loss, which is the typical sign of an avascular necrosis, where they're going to lose that bone until they get to the wider portion of the bone, and chances are that implant, it does integrate, and it creates a restorative problem. So I want an implant that had a thread design that was more aggressive so when I placed it against the palatal bone, it engaged that bone and kept it from walking, and I could keep it against that palatal bone away, at least one to two millimeters away from the thin labial plate. So hence, that's the design that we see on the HOD implant. So far. Yeah, how many have you placed, and what's your experience so far? How many HODs? Okay, so I've placed over 600 and restored over 600 Han implants. The response has been phenomenal. First of all, the soft tissue response has been great. In fact, the tissue is so tight when we take off the healing abutments that when we go to put on transfers or um, the final abutments, the patient says, boy, that's really tight. And so that's good because that's a good seal. So we're happy with that. So we're happy with the tissue responses. The other thing is the primary stability, even in poor quality bone, that we can achieve primary stability, that we can give the patient an immediate temporary. So the conical connection is very positive, that when we place our impression copings, that even though we take a radiograph every time we do that to make sure it's seated, very rarely, is it not engaged? It's exactly where we put it. Now, I designed, I use closed tray. Now, I'm not saying it's better than open tray, but that's what I do. I'm not good with open tray. I'm better with closed tray because that's my many years of experience with. So I wanted to design an impression coping that had real deep definitive grooves, both vertically and circular around some deep indentations, so that when we take the impression out, we take the transfer coping, put it in an analog, I do this myself, so that when I put it in the impression, it snaps, you can hear the pop, that it's very positive, and Glidewell Laboratory can tell you of the many hundreds of cases that they've done for me, very rarely, have I had to cut a, a framework or anything that didn't fit? That's good. That's good. Um, good answer. So um, let's talk a little bit about. There's doctors all over the country that are using the Han system, right? So you must be you must be getting feedback from those doctors. What what kinds of things are they saying to you? <laughs> well, one guy called me up and said, "I love your fucking implants." <laughs> 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 Bridget. <laughs> We're done here. <laughs> we, we have our slogan. <laughs> wow. Now, the response from practitioners that have placed Han implants has been phenomenal. I mean, they've sent me emails. Some have even called me, even though I don't hear real good on the phone, but or text me, and it's been so positive. And some of the names of patient of the practitioners that are placing it are much bigger names than mine, and people that I've said, "Whoa, wow, 
what a compliment. You know, it's like, you know, having Tom Brady endorse a football. You know, that, that's the best football you ever threw. That's, that's inflated. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, well, how did it feel to have the Mish Institute make the Han implant their official implant? Well, you know, that's Carl Mish has designed and placed thousands of implants. He's written many textbooks. He's contributed more to implant dentistry than any one person in the world. And to have him say he likes the implant and endorses the implant, I, 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 there's, there's no words for me to say it's, it's better than the good housekeeping seal of approval. Um, it's like even better than getting final American Dental Association approval. I mean, that's, that's it. That, that's, there's, nothing, there's nothing better. And when the people at Glidewell told me that Carl has endorsed the implant, I was like dancing around all day that way. Carl Misch likes the implant. The Misch implant likes the implant. And so when people say, well, tell me about the Han implant, I just say, well, the Misch Institute is, has adopted and endorsed it. And that's all I need to say because of his reputation. Okay, you know what? I'm going to ask you to say that I feel honored by the endorsement from the Misch Institute. Yeah. Just, just say those words. Yeah, and it's just such an honor for me uh, in my stage of my career to have the endorsement and, again, the sort of housekeeping seal of approval from the Misch Institute. Great, great. You said it way better than I did. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so how does it feel to have an implant system with your name on it? How did that come about that you put your name on that system? I didn't really myself put the name, my name on it. I, I got an ego, but not that big. Um, what it is, we look at so many since we came out, I came up with the idea of that first tapered implant and it became so popular. Naturally, the industry, there's going to be many companies copying a tapered design. So we come up with another, the Han implant without the Han name. Say it's Osteo Great or something like that. People think, well, that's just another implant and uh, forget about it. But figuring that putting my name to it, knowing uh, many people know that I'm sort of the father of the tapered implant, that this has to be something better and different if his name's on it and he's the one that did it. So that, that was the feeling of why calling it the Han implant. Very nice, very nice. So what, what is the impact that you see of the Han system on dentistry? What I try to do is to simplify it. And, I, and my idea is I, I've always been a proponent of general dentists placing implants with proper training. And the Mish Institute is one of the best avenues for this proper training. But it belongs in the hands of general dentistry because the general dentist is the one that's going to also restore so, you know, I wanted to make a, a system that was simple. I wanted to have a simple uh, protocol for the drilling, making the osteotomy with a uh, step-by-step of the tapered drills. We wanted to have some safety. We continued to keep improving. We just improved the kit. We put in eight millimeter starter uh, drills or burrs. Uh, one and a half, two millimeter, so that when you went in, you had safety. You can't go more than eight. And then take an x-ray and check yourself, see where you are. Well, these are things to give the general dentist a kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling that we're dealing something that can be safe as well as really helping people. So you think that the Han system will help more general dentists successfully start placing implants? Yes. Yeah, say something like yeah. that. And so with the Han system, I wanted to have an implant and a kit, drilling kit, that is 
more user-friendly for general dentists that may not have years and years of experience. And uh, we're going to continue to improve and, and, and as we see things. So I wanted to make healing abutments. Let's just take healing abutments. Things that frustrate me on a daily basis, I try to eliminate and say, well, how can we make it so it doesn't frustrate you? Let's take healing abutments. Healing abutments are parallel cylinders, right? So most of the time when you reflect the tissue, no matter how tall the healing abutment is, you're trying to hold the tissue down to keep it from coming over the healing abutment. It's like putting a 10-legged cat in a bag. So you're trying to hold it down, get the suture. So now I developed a healing abutment that's like an hourglass that comes like this, that uh, you have a wider portion to support the tissue to create a good emergence profile, and then you have like an undercut to hold the tissue and stabilize it. And the tissues heal so beautifully. Now that's just one thing. The impression copings, again, with the deep grooves and things like that, to ensure the accuracy of your impressions. And then, of course, I work with Glidewell Laboratory. They're the ones that manufacture the implants. They have the know-how. They do more implant restorations than any laboratory in the world. So they've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. So working with them, they also come up with some ideas, some things that we can even make it better. And again, they're dealing with general dentistry. I'm not going to say how many thousands of cases they get every day, but they get thousands of cases every day. So again, now my forte has been teaching general dentists. I've been teaching general dentists for over 25 years. And I have so many that come up and say to me, you changed my life. Uh, I'm placing implants. Of course, they went on and took other courses. But they come to me, people at the AID meeting, people at the ICY meeting, people, prosthodontists, oral surgeons at the uh, Academy of Osteo Integration meeting come up and say, you taught me my first implant. And so that's a great impact. If I can change uh, professional lives and if I can make it easier for more general dentists to place implants, then that's what I can contribute to the profession. And, and you know, getting back to beginning into the Han implant and why I associated with, with Glidewell, I was frustrated the company that I was consulting with didn't want to take my ideas anymore and I felt that I still wanted to contribute to the profession. I still have a lot of years to go that I can do that and uh, people like Clydewell who I've worked with for many years in the past but they were with uh, the company that I was previously with. Um, Dave Casper, Greg Nensemeyer, Neil Park, uh, some of the engineers, and uh, uh, Grant Bellows. Bellows. Um, and so it was a, a, a natural marriage, and it's been a great marriage, and I think we're going to continue to go on for many years and come up uh, the biggest con contribution to dentistry. That's great, Jack. That's great. Say something maybe about uh, Jim Glidewell. The, the, uh, yeah, uh, with Jim Glidewell. Now, the other person that I've gotten to know is basically the owner of this whole business, Jim Glidewell. And we've talked, we've had some meetings. He has the exact same vision. And he's done that with the company and laboratory, just with ceramics, with zirconium, uh, just with the machinery that manufactures uh, the CAD CAM machines, uh, all of the things he continues to improve. Every time I visit Glidewell, I see new machines. I see that he doesn't skimp on expanding. I see new buildings. We go in. I see that he's added machines for Han implants. He went over with me how excited he was. He had the same excitement that I had when we were watching the implants being manufactured. So 
That's the kind of situation that we want, somebody that's open-minded. And the last time I was here a few weeks ago at the Mission Institute, he came up to me and he said, Jack, don't hold back. We will do anything you want to do. You just tell us. We will do it. And so what, you know, what else can you ask for? That's like going to a restaurant and saying, you can have everything that's on the menu. Don't worry about it. So you don't have to make a choice. 